After running my YouTube channel, Self Publishing with Dale, for the past two and a half years, I've discovered there's many great indie authors that have yet to be discovered. So that's why I thought I would start an indie author spotlight. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you someone that I am a personal fan of and one of my favorites and I believe that you will enjoy him too. So make sure that you stick around. Welcome to Self Publishing with Dale, where you'll learn how to publish books that sell and build an unstoppable brand. Today is the first segment in the Indie Author Stories series, and it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you somebody that I consider very much awesome in the self publishing space. His name is Michael Laron. Michael Laron is the host of Author Level Up on YouTube, where every week he publishes videos to help you write better, write faster, have fun, and be prolific. He's written over 40 books in his videos document what he's learned every step of the way. If you caught my YouTube video about 10 best YouTube channels for learning how to self-publish in 2017, then you know I'm a huge fan of Michael's. And that's what brings him to the show today. So without any further ado, let's get on over to the live segment. Welcoming to the show and the new show here on Facebook Live, none other than one of my favorites, Michael Laron. Michael, how you feeling, man? I am fantastic. I, I'm feeling like a guinea pig tonight. Yep. I, uh, the first indie author spotlight. We're doing Facebook Live. We're trying some new technology stuff, and it's going swimmingly well so far tonight. Yes, uh, you I'm know. It, well, Thanks we, we it it went live <laughs> automatically. I forgot it goes right live on the hour, and I was just like, we're just gonna go ahead and talk. So if some of you guys caught us behind the scenes, you know, knuckle deep in our noses, we're sorry about that. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, if you, if you heard those curse words, just ignore them. <laughs> Are you capable of cursing, Michael? I've never heard you say a curse word. I, I occasionally, you know, I stub my toe or, you know, I'll, 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 I'll pick the wrong T or I'll oversteep my T, those sorts of things. Then you'll, you'll hear me curse. But generally, yeah. I try to keep it G-rated. That, that's good. It doesn't yeah. always happen. Though. Hey, you know, that, YouTube, that on my YouTube channel, that. you know happens yeah for sure but uh you know we're gonna have a little bit of fun today i've already seen that we have a few people in the live chat right now so i want to give a big shout out to a few of them i see mark brownless is in the house my brother none other than uh walter roberts in the house uh i got a few brothers by the way so i had to be very specific about the brother that was here kathy mankins here and if you happen to be popping in you got questions for michael please load him up this guy has been around this industry a little longer than me and he has a little bit more insights in the indie publishing community so are you ready for this michael i've got a few questions and hopefully you had a chance to kind of breeze through those Yes, I am ready, and welcome to all the viewers. Glad to have all you guys with us, and let's let's get, let's get to it. Dude, let's you're so it. good at this. You're like a pro, man. <laughs> I don't know. I, I try. Yeah. Tell <laughs> you're, us... you're, you're way more pro than I am. Oh, yeah. You, you were talking about the whole Inception thing here in Facebook, where it's just like Zoom's inside, Slob's is inside Facebook. So uh, that was our, our little inside chat. But enough about that. Tell us a little bit about your background in writing. Sure, so I got started, just like everyone probably watching this and, and listening to this got started, is I was a kid, you know, writing on construction paper as a kid. <laughs> you know, I, I wrote my parents out of house and home is what I like to say. And, um, you know, I always wanted to be a writer. You know, I, I think a lot of people can identify with that. And I had done it, did it a little bit in middle school, did it a little bit in high school and got to college and I, I decided that I wanted to go down the literary fiction route. I wanted to write the most beautiful sentences known to mankind. I wanted to spend hours and hours on my manuscripts and get to the point where I was 65 years old and be able to retire because I wrote that one best-selling novel that everyone you know, acclaimed me for. And lo and behold, that didn't work out so well. No, no publisher wanted to look at my stuff. You know, okay. I, I, I wrote manuscripts, agents wouldn't touch me, Publishers wouldn't touch me, lit mags wouldn't touch me, and so I got discouraged. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, it, it, it's it's the it's the natural thing, right? I mean, you write tons and tons and tons, and no one, you're just not seeing any benefit from it. And so, I, I kind of decided to kind of give up. And in 2012, my life changed forever. So I was on a nice dinner with my wife, and I fell ill later that night with what I thought was food poisoning. 
lo and behold, it was food poisoning, but I didn't leave the hospital for a month. So when I was in the hospital, I picked up some, uh, picked up an infection that basically could have been life threatening for me. And so I remember very vividly being on my hospital bed with a IV in my arm, I'm doped up on morphine and I'm having hallucinations, the funniest hallucinations you'll ever think of. And I, I just thinking, what am I doing with my life? You know, what, what is it that, that drives me? I, I'm literally probably on my deathbed and, and what am I going to do? What, what's going to change moving forward? And so I swore on that hospital bed right then and there that I would become a writer no matter what, and that I would bend the universe around me to be successful. And so that's when I decided to get out of the hospital and I, I recovered and I, I, I let all that perfectionism go from the literary fiction route. Just let it go. I mean, nothing, nothing changes your habits faster than uh, staring death in the face. <laughs> and so I decided to, to jump into lit or co commercial fiction, which is what I enjoyed reading the most, and decided to become a self-published writer and haven't looked back, man. This is so funny. I, you literally covered the very next question of, you know, why did you decide to go into independent when publishing books? And this is so cool. So um, I, I think it's probably good that I bring up do you think, and see, I see a lot of people that want to go to the traditional publishing route, and the reason they always say is because if you do indie publishing or self-publishing, that it's indicated that's an inferior product versus something in traditional publishing. What's your stance on that? Do you think that your book has suffered, or your books, I should say, since you have over 40 of them, uh, do you think they have suffered from being indie published versus if they were traditionally published? Not at all. Nope. In fact, I highly doubt that a publisher would have looked at anything that I wrote during my first few years as an author. I, I highly doubt that they would look at anything that I'm writing now. Mm -hmm. um, they have a very narrow view of what they think a book should be. And it's not to dig them. I mean, they, they reproduce what's successful and what makes money for them. But I found that growing up, um, particularly as an African-American boy, that I didn't see representation or people that look like me when I grew up, you know, when I was reading books growing up. And I still don't think that's really the case with a lot of traditional publishers. And so um, what I would have loved to have seen is someone who looked like me writing books on a regular basis with characters that look like me, with backgrounds that were similar to mine. Yeah. And you just don't see that still today in traditional publishing. And so I love self-publishing because it gives me the freedom to write whatever I want to write and whenever I want to write it on my own terms and let the market decide on, you know, who's, who's going to be successful and what books they want to buy. That's really cool. And you've been hanging around since 2012 then. That's uh, yep. there's a good reason why you have over 40 books then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I published my first book in 2014 and um, I decided, you know, I'm just going to going to go all into this and I'm going to figure out how to be as efficient as possible, figure out how to save as much time as possible and you know, I've managed to do all this, man, with, with a full-time job, um, a, a young daughter. I have a four-year-old daughter mm -hmm. um, who was born same year I published my first book. Um, and I even attend law school classes in the evenings. And so I've learned how to do all this and balance all this, you know, on, on kind of a shoestring with no time and, and all that. So I, I've, I've kind of figured out if I, if I can learn how to do this, and I think anyone can figure it out. Yeah, this it, it's incredible. You uh, really are the you epitomize what indie publishing is all about. It's trying to just make it work, and with a part time schedule, no less. You are a person that I, I said before we connected here. You are very Googleable. I can, I can literally find you just about any. I'm like Michael Laurent. Boom. There's a thousand choices to choose from, and we're going to talk about a few of those <laughs> things in just a moment. I found something very interesting, and you and I were having a personal conversation, I think it was about a month ago, and you haven't just wrote in one niche. You've done many niches. Do you care to share some of those niches? Which ones were successful? Which ones weren't so successful for you? Yeah, you bet. So I've written in the science fiction and fantasy genres. Um, I've also done some nonfiction for writers, and then under a pen name that I really don't talk about too much, I've done some poetry. Really? So, huh. yeah, I've done poetry. So uh, I enjoy it. I, I try to write, I didn't do it this year, but I try to write around one poetry collection a year. It's just kind of fun. It's, it's, it slows down the pace. It's a little bit different. Um, but that was not very successful. <laughs> okay. and, and 
uh, not not a very successful niche for me, but I, I, I do it just because I enjoyed it. And it's a kind of a break from, you know, YouTube and, and fiction and nonfiction. Mm-hmm. I would say my most successful niches have been space opera. So I have a nine book space opera series called Galaxy Mavericks that is, has done really well for me. Um, I've also been successful with urban fantasy. So my buddy Justin Sloan and I, we wrote a urban fantasy thriller um, type book, and it's, it's uh, called Modern Necromancy. And it's about a necromancer who's basically chasing uh, a madman around the world to save the world and, and stop him from unleashing an army of the dead <laughs> on the world. And um, that has been a, a super successful endeavor for both myself and Justin. Um, and then I've also done some dark fantasy as well. Um, I have a series called The Last Dragon Lord, and it's about an evil dragon lord and, you know, bloodthirsty and revenge and all that fun stuff. And that's that's been pretty successful for me. And um, I've also done nonfiction for writers, so I have some books for writers to help them get better at the craft, help them learn how to be more professional, help them learn how to navigate the the, the murky waters of self-publishing, and, and that has been fairly successful for me, too. I feel kind of bad because I've watched a lot of your YouTube videos. In fact, I consumed a lot of it while you were on hiatus. Uh, that's literally when I stumbled on you. It, I came up and I'm like, wow, he hasn't published anything in a long time, and I started consuming it a lot. So I was not aware that you actually had a nonfiction series based on writing itself. So can we find that over in, say, Amazon Store or elsewhere? Yep, it's under the pen name ML Ron. So I like to keep my fiction and my nonfiction mm-hmm. separate. So if you search for ML and then Ron, R-O-N-N, you'll find them. And you can also find all, all the nonfiction books I have at authorlevelup.com which is the name of my YouTube channel. So it's all there, easy, easy for you to find. That's really, really cool. Why did you choose a different name for your nonfiction and your fiction? I, I like to keep them separate. So, mm-hmm. you know, there, there's something to the idea that readers get analysis paralysis. If you give them too many choices, mm-hmm. if you show them too many different things that are, are different, they don't know where to start especially if they're they're on a place like Amazon. And so I made the conscious decision to write all of my fiction or most of my fiction under Michael Laron. And so all of my covers have the same brand. So if you look at any of my covers, you know it's a Michael Laron cover because my name is really big at the top. Yeah. And then I've got um, you know some, some, some things with all of my covers that make them look very distinct and, and cohesive. Mm-hmm. So that way, if, if readers are looking at my books in fiction, they know, okay, this is Michael Laron. This is a fiction book. It's science fiction or it's fantasy. Super clear, right? Mm -hmm. And so for my nonfiction, I've also got some nonfiction books where um, those are branded differently. And and so you can look at my ML Ron books and you you can kind of know right then and there that these are nonfiction books for writers. So for me, it was a very conscious marketing decision and just helping create, create those clear choices for my readers. Now, of the two, I imagine, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I assume that your fiction brand's probably doing a little bit better than your nonfiction brand? It, it's about it's about equal. Really? Okay, cool. Yeah, it's about equal. So my nonfiction, you know, I, I started my YouTube channel back in 2015, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, I really didn't do much with it. I, 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 I released a lot of videos, but for really, it was really an experiment, mm-hmm. you know? And so I went on a hiatus just because I had some things going on in my life, you know, after about a year and a half. And... I just came back within the last six months. And so my YouTube channel is now starting to pick up a lot of steam. And so my nonfiction is doing much better than it had, had been in the past. And so it's starting to get to the level where it's, it's, about, to, it's about ready to surpass my fiction, but, but not quite. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's, it's a fantastic channel. Anybody gets the opportunity, go check out. There's a good reason why I'm a huge fan of his work. It's super professional. Everything's dialed in. Um, it was how I actually modeled a lot of what I was doing on in my early films, or early films, early videos. I watched yours, and I was like, okay, I can tell he's got it scripted, and I like that. It feels more like a newscast versus just like a vlog of some sort, and so I always love that, that content. But um, I want to kind of dive in just a little bit deeper here. Let's do it. Who are your writing influences? Who are the people that you look to and say, that person inspired me to become a writer and they continue to influence you now? Sure. So I, my influences come from lifestyle and productivity more so than actual writing style. Hmm. So my top influences would be in no particular order. Michael Crichton. Jurassic Park was just an incredible book. I mean, just incredibly written, 
just it just made me envious just made me want to quit you know <laughs> I, I i just i just couldn't do it anymore i was like okay this is this book is just so good that i'll never top this so michael crichton pretty much anything he's written um it's just been fantastic um ray bradbury he's the one that made me want to be a writer so i actually dedicated my first book to ray bradbury for that very reason um so anything ray bradbury's written his short stories fahrenheit 451 the martian chronicles all that stuff is just you know i i love ray bradbury's work um and then for the fact that he was so prolific robert lewis stevenson so he's the guy that wrote treasure island so in addition to treasure island being a fantastic book if you look at robert lewis stevenson's life he was incredibly prolific i mean this is a guy that wrote book after book after book and they were just all incredible i mean he wrote he wrote jekyll and hyde <laughs> he wrote treasure island um he, he wrote books about like the war of the roses you know novels that took place during that and everything he did was always different but it always felt like a robert lewis stevenson novel and so his model of productivity and how productive he was was inspiring to me because I, I feel like i'm i'm drawn toward prolific personalities because I tend, I tend to be a pretty prolific person. And so I really admire those writers that can really just sit down and write book after book after book and just create these amazing experiences. And so Michael Crichton, Ray Bradbury, Robert Louis Stevenson, all probably some of the most prolific writers in history. That's so cool. So you'd like to see that volume of literature. It's kind of one of those proof and validation of, of an author making it to you. It's not so much proof or validation of them making it. It's... Yeah. I am drawn to people that love to listen to their inner spirit. So there's something about Ray Bradbury. I mean, near the, near the end of his life, I mean, he was writing a short story a day. And, you know, Ray Bradbury has that famous challenge of, a, you know, I dare you to write a short story every week for a year and you can't write a bad one. You know, you can't write 52 bad short stories. There's got to be at least one good one in there somewhere, right? And so just that ability to, to listen to themselves and just charge through and just create content, even if people are going to laugh at them, you know, there, there's just something very bold and brave and, and courageous about that that I admire. That's really cool. I, li I like de digging deep on that one. All right, we're going to shift gears a little bit. Let's go back to YouTube. Um, why did you start to do a YouTube channel? I know my reasons, but I need to kind of figure out, you know, you weren't just sitting around one day and were like, I like writing, I'm gonna go ahead and do a YouTube channel. Yeah, it was, it was more of an experiment. So, you know, we've all heard the advice, you know, you need to be everywhere. Yeah, authors have to be everywhere. That's bogus advice, by the way. <laughs> bogus <laughs> advice, but I followed it. And so I was everywhere. Yeah. So right around this time was when I went all into Google Plus and that didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> Google Plus will miss you. <laughs> You're going to ask me about my biggest mistake. That's probably in the top 10. <laughs> um, so Google Plus didn't go anywhere. I mean, you know, Guy Kawasaki wrote that book that everybody talked about and everyone jumped in. That didn't work. And so I, okay, what am I going to do? What, what, what's going to be my social media network? Yeah. And so I was kind of looking at YouTube and I thought, well, this is kind of a social media network, but it's also a search engine. So what if I could create a, a, a YouTube channel for writers that talked about how my process and how I do things? What would that what would that look like? And so I, I, I decided to try it on a whim. Like you'll 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 learn when you hang around me. Almost everything I do is an experiment. Like I have no real every book I write. I have no expectations of any book that I write. I just do it because it's just something that I, I want to try. And if it succeeds, awesome, I'm gonna learn from that. If it doesn't, then I'm gonna learn from that too. And it's gonna help me with the next book. And so I was like, okay, well, what if I had this crazy idea to do a YouTube channel that where it kind of looks like the Apple commercials where you got that real nice white background, you know? And yes. you know, what would, that, what would that look like? And so I did that and I shot all those videos on my smartphone and I would shoot three videos a week just to see what happened. Yeah. And the response was like, that was like the it was like a decision i made on a whim and it was actually probably one of the best decisions that i ever made as a writer and i found that those tend to be the decisions that tend to be your best ones yep. <laughs> you do you do it and you don't think about it yet you know you can have these other decisions where you spend all this time thinking about it oh i gotta I, this is gonna be the best book launch ever it's gonna be the best best book ever man people are gonna they're, they're gonna bow down and, and and just you know ship me boatloads of money and then <laughs> 
<laughs> he said it. Sound the alarm. He cursed. <laughs> did, 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 uh, that curse? Flop is a curse? No, you, you, you said shit me both, both loads of money. Oh, I, I meant to say shipped. <laughs> <laughs> I forced you to curse. Oh, well. Yeah, ex exactly. I'm sorry, continue. <laughs> no, no, so so, so it was a whim decision, honestly. And yeah. I, I, I didn't think anything would come out of it. I just wanted to try it. And I found that blogging, I sucked at it. I just, it's just, blogging is not my spirit animal. Yeah. Podcasting, I'd done podcasting off and on, and, you know, I enjoyed it. But I didn't necessarily have, a, I didn't want to do an interview podcast. So it just wasn't my thing. And so I was like, well, I'll try video. I'm, I'm the most introverted person on the planet, but maybe video might work. And turns out that was exactly like, that was, that was exactly what I needed. That's, that was the best way for me to um, express myself was through video. And I would have never known. Nice, nice. Well, so that's a long answer to your short question. No, no, and, and with a brief like interruption on my part, thinking that you're cursing, you're actually just, you know, I didn't hear it properly. I, I need to adjust my hearing aids here just a second. Um, I'll, I'll let you believe I cursed. It's all good. <laughs> nice. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe you'll get a maybe you'll get a curse word out of me before we're over. Nice. There we go. Hey, <laughs> hey, not not a problem. I don't think Facebook's going to demonetize me, so we're we're good to go. Has the YouTube channel? helped you in gaining exp exposure for your fiction and of course your nonfiction brands. Yeah. Two words, Joanna Penn. So, ah, um, yes. Joanna Tell us Penn, about Joanna Penn. So Joanna Penn saw some of my YouTube videos, um, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And so she shot me a message on Twitter and said, Hey, I, I love your videos. I would love for you to come on you know, my podcast and, and, and talk about YouTube for writers. And, and after I picked myself off the floor, I was like, okay, awesome. Yeah, I would love to love to do this. And so I went on her show and I talked about my process of the things that I've learned. And, you know, I was very, very, not very far into my YouTube journey yet, but a lot of people got a lot of benefit out of it. And, you know, she sent so many people my way, it was just unreal. <laughs> and so that gained all kinds of exposure for my videos. Um, you know, my for, for the first time ever, I was actually making money on AdSense. Um, and it started and it just didn't stop. And so I was like, okay, well, what else can I do? And so I started doing more videos per week. And, um, and then I started to find that some of the videos that I was doing were ranking in search. So I have a video called how to outline your novel 10 ways. And that's my most successful video of all time. Wow. Um, I, it, it, it's just, it's crazy. <laughs> Even when I was on a hiatus, that video was still getting views and, and, and people were emailing me asking kind of where I was and, you know, it, it, like I said, it's things that you, you do and you don't think about yeah. that often have the biggest impact. So yeah, it, it definitely, definitely elevated my exposure um, to my brand. And so now, now that I'm back on YouTube and I'm all in on it, yeah. I'm writing nonfiction books and I'm publishing them. So for example, I have a book coming out probably next week because <laughs> my editor just emailed me just as I said that last sentence. Um, I have a book coming out next week called How to Write Your First Novel. So nice. people email me all the time. And they asked me, how do you write a novel? And so I said, okay, well, I'm just going to come up with a book and I'm going to write a book about how to write your first novel. And so that's coming out next week. And so that's something that I can promote on the channel and that will elevate my sales and, you know, help people that, that need that help. And yeah, YouTube has been just a phenomenal blessing for me. Nice. Yeah. It's, it's really, uh, I, I'm always impressed with the, the quality of content that you're, you're producing all the time and you're very cerebral about how you approach a lot of the the resources and tools that you provide on there so that's one of the things i enjoy i, I just enjoy nerding out about some things you know like you were yes. weighing in on things like grammarly <laughs> and pro writing aid i, I thought yeah. that was very fascinating by the way anybody gets the opportunity we're not going to share the story here go over to author level up you have to find out why he went on hiatus michael you can't tell him here they got to go over okay. to the youtube channel and actually find out why you went on hiatus it is Stranger than fiction, <laughs> it really is. When I heard that, I was like, "Is this it's guy funny. for real?" I'm like, "Man." So, um, what advice do you have for aspiring authors? Some people that haven't actually hit the publish yet. They're like, they're writing great content. They're they're really trying to just etch some good stuff out, but they haven't hit that publish yet. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of examples I can give you, if I may. Please. So. Um, you know Steve Harvey, right? Famous yeah. American comedian, super funny guy. Mm -hmm. He's, he does inspirational videos on the side. And he has a video, 
and I, I forget the name of it, but he it, it's him. He's kind of he's kind of in his office and he's just sitting and chilling and he's he's talking about taking that leap of faith, even if you don't know how to do it. And he 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 equates it to standing on the edge of a cliff with a parachute on your back. Just jump, just do it. You, your parachute will 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 open. You know when you're in the air, but you have to make that jump. You have to take that leap of faith and trust that it will open. If you don't do that, you're just going to be standing on that cliff and you're going to watch all these other happy people breeze on by with their parachutes. And I've always thought that that was a, a just a fantastic metaphor for why aspiring authors just need to jump off that cliff and open up their parachutes. So that's my first piece of advice. Yeah. Um, my second piece of advice for aspiring writers would be I- advice. So there's a lot of BS out there. <laughs> let's just let's just be what? honest. <laughs> Did you hear me? Yeah, there's a lot of BS out there, right? <laughs> then there's a lot of disreputable service providers and and a lot of people that are just just they're just fleecing authors. They're just taking advantage of people, you know. And and there are other people out there who are giving really good advice freely, but that advice may not necessarily be relevant for you in your situation. So mm-hmm. my advice is 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 to remember that there are three types of advice. There's advice that's meant for you. There's advice that's not meant for you and there's advice that you're not ready for yet. And so Mm. the difference between a, a new writer and a more experienced writer is just developing that BS detector to look at the advice and be able to piece out the bits that work best for you. So if I told you, Dale, that you should get all your books published um, through Ingram spark, Ingram spark is fantastic, right? Yeah. They're a fantastic service. That makes sense if book if, if if print is part of your strategy. If you wanted to get into bookstores and libraries, yeah. that would be a perfect example of uh, advice that's meant for you. If I told you, on the other hand, that I think Dale, that you should get all of your books published in Spanish because Spanish is the next biggest language, and you write poetry, that's probably not advice that's meant for you. Right. <laughs> you know that that's not good advice. I mean, it might be good for the person that that gave it. But that's not going to be relevant for you in your situation, but they're going to sell it to you as if it is, yeah. right? And if I gave you advice that you're not ready for, a classic example is someone told me five years ago that you need to hire a virtual assistant. You will not be able to survive if you do not hire a virtual assistant. And so back in 2014, I wasn't ready for that. I mean, I, I didn't have any money. You know, <laughs> who, who am I going to hire a virtual assistant with? What am I going to do? I mean, I, what am I going to do? Barter with them? That, that that it didn't apply to me at that time but now i'm starting to build a team that you know I, that i pay part time to help me edit my videos to help me with some things that i just don't have time for and when it was given to me that was advice that i wasn't ready for yet but i'm ready for it now and so think about that when you're developing that bs detector as well that's really cool that's very very sage advice i have oftentimes see i have a ton of backlog in videos and sometimes there are newbies that will approach a video and uh, for instance a newbie will go oh should i publish on publish drive or should i publish on draft to digital and they're, they're getting overwhelmed and i'm like okay this is kind of advanced type stuff i would recommend you do this uh, so yeah, you're, you're so right. You hit the nail on the head. This is one I need to snip and put a clip up so that everybody kind of understands that not all the advice that I dispense is going to be tailor made for you. Exactly. Excellent. I love it, man. What was one of your biggest mistakes? You already kind of covered one of them. Google plus one of my biggest mistakes, <laughs> Google plus, <laughs> I, I would say, um, you know, do you want do you want an example that's relevant more to fiction writers, or do you want one that's relevant more to like nonfiction? Give me a give me your best one. Just go with your gut on this. My best mistake. Okay, so my best mis- my best mistake was thinking that people wanted to to engage with every single piece of content that I created. So when I first started, I I had this really bright idea, Dale. So when I launched my YouTube channel, I also launched a podcast and I also was launching my blogs. And so I decided I'm going to do all of this at once. And so I had a podcast and it was called Driving with Michael. And I'm not making this up. I would go to the gym and I would put my cell phone on my dashboard of my car and I would talk about whatever was on my mind. And so 
I just talked about random stuff. I talked about gyms. I talked about working out. I talked about all kinds of stuff that had no relevance at all <laughs> to any anyone that will want to listen to anything I had to say. In fact, I got 13 readers or 13 listeners for like all time for, for one of my episodes. And so um, I, I just didn't understand that. And so what I've learned over the years um, is that you have to create that emotional connection with people. Like you have to tell them your why. You know, Simon Sinek, the famous TED Talk, he always said, you know, people don't care about what you do until they know why you do it. And so that was my biggest mistake early on was because I thought I knew what people wanted. I thought I thought they wanted content, but what they really wanted was to know, learn more about me. And I didn't give that to them. I just gave them the content and it was dry and it was stilted and I didn't have an author voice. And, you know, when I was podcasting and doing social media and all that other stuff. And so it fell flat. And so now how I've become successful is creating that emotional connection and, and showing people that um, this is who I am. This is what I stand for. This is what I believe. Here's my personality. You can see me, you can hear me, you can make your own decisions about whether you want to continue to engage with my content, but I'm always going to be real. And so that has served me very well. And it, it's something I didn't do very early on in my career. Wow. That's, that's really good advice, and I swear to you, it's almost like you were describing my exact story. <laughs> so this is really good. Uh, all right, well, hey, we're going to start to wrap things up, but before we tune out, how can our audience get a hold of you? Well, you can find me at my website, authorlevelup.com. That's where you can find out more about my YouTube channel, get links to all my videos, and, and links to all my writing books for, for nonfiction you know, for writers and writing craft and all that stuff. Okay. If you're interested in my fiction and anything that I've had to say for my fiction today, you can visit me at michaelleron.com. You can find links to all my books and, and all the things that I'm currently up to. Wonderful. Very good. Hey, it's been a true pleasure to have you on here and we broke ground. It looks like everything was going pretty good. I've noticed a few people kind of engaging. We've actually had a few viewers and Kathy Mankin says, what does BS mean? What does that stand for, Michael? <laughs> I, 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 I think I think it means um, bullshitsu. I, I think that's the, uh, you can't the get term it out I've, of I've heard referred to it as. I don't know. I, we may have to consult a dictionary, Kathy. I don't know. Oh, oh, good one, Kathy. That was good. Nice try, though. That was good, Kathy. I'll see it. She's like, she's like reeling it in. I was like, what's she saying over here? I've been. If, if you notice me looking off to the side, I'm like looking at the comments and such over here. So it's really been a fantastic time here. Uh, I want to make sure. And uh, if any of you right now are watching this over in the self-publishing books group, and I don't see your comments, unfortunately, we're in the actual self-publishing with Dale like page here on Facebook. So with that being said, we're gonna continue this indie author spotlight series. And I'm glad, Michael, that you decided to <laughs> I shouldn't say decided. I kind of threw him. and It's like one of you Michael's experiments. I threw it against the wall to see if it'd <laughs> stick. And Michael was like, let's do it. So like 10 minutes before I was like, oh, hey, let's, let's try this. Yep. Okay, let's yep. Oddly enough, I'd actually planned this probably about a couple weeks ago. I'd send it out in the emails and I was like, you know what? Let's try out Michael. But uh, I would love to, if you get the opportunity uh, to bring you over to the YouTube channel. And I want to talk to you a little bit more about your experience with the Alliance of Independent Authors, because I know that you have some experience there, so I would like to know a little bit more about that. So do you think you'd be game for doing that? Oh, absolutely, anytime, and it's been my pleasure, and, and I appreciate you having me on the show. Well, fantastic. Well, folks, if you enjoyed today's video content, do me a favor, hit that thumbs up right here in the Facebook, and make sure that you click the little like on this page and hit the follow so you see it first and you won't miss a single Indie Author Spotlight series. And if you are an indie author, please feel free to reach out to me. In the meantime, and in between time, this has been Self Publishing with Dale and my good friend, Michael Laron over here. And we're gonna peace out, folks.